Okay, we're going to talk about the thyroid and parathyroid glands and answer the what questions. What is the topography, vascular supply, and histology of the thyroid parathyroid glands? What hormones are secreted by them? What is the stimulation, function, and inhibition for these hormones, T3, T4, calcitonin from thyroid, and parathyroid hormone from parathyroid gland? And what are the steps for synthesizing the T3, T4 hormones? Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Morton, and I am the noted anatomist. Okay, so the thyroid gland is located immediately below the thyroid cartilage. It has two lobes and an isthmus. So there is the thyroid cartilage. This is the Adam's apple, the laryngeal prominence, where the vocal folds are. And immediately beneath it, or inferior, is the thyroid gland outlined here in yellow. It has a right lobe and a left lobe connected essentially by the isthmus. So it looks much like uh, a bow tie. And there may also be a pyramidal lobe, and it gets its name because it's a little pyramid that's most of the time on the left lobe of the thyroid gland. And the uh, pyramidal lobe is a embryonic remnant of the thyroglossal duct. Um, connects all the way up to the foramen cecum, uh, may connect all the way up to the foramen cecum in the tongue. So the thyroid gland in Greek, or thyroid in Greek means shield. Not so much this shield, but this shield, and like a shield that you'd see on, on a knight. And when you take a look at the thyroid cartilage and thyroid gland, if you kind of use your imagination, it kind of looks like a shield. Now, the parathyroid gland is located on the posterior surface of the left and right lobes of the thyroid, and there are usually four glands. So in this posterior view of the neck, there's the left lobe and the right lobe of the thyroid gland, and there's one, two, three, four parathyroid glands. And that prefix para means alongside or near because these glands are near the thyroid gland. So the vascular supply for both thyroid and parathyroid glands is via the inferior and superior thyroid arteries, and they are drained by the superior, middle, and inferior thyroid veins. So let's look at those. So here we have um, on the posterior view there coming off the subclavian artery is the thyrocervical trunk. It bilaterally comes off both subclavian arteries and that thyrocervical trunk gives rise to the inferior thyroid artery that supplies the bottom of the thyroid gland. And you look on the other side, the anterior view, there's the inferior thyroid artery. And then the superior thyroid artery supplying the upper lobes arises from the external carotid artery and you can see superior thyroid arteries on both views. There's so much blood that goes, the thyroid gland in real life has this kind of reddish appearance because of vascular it is. Now, the thyroid is drained by a superior and, in, and middle thyroid veins that drain directly into the IJ or internal jugular vein. And then the inferior thyroid vein drains directly into the brachiocephalic vein. And all of that blood goes directly to the superior vena cava to the heart. So now the histology of the thyroid gland. We're going to just take a little section there and shing, there we've got is a histological section of the thyroid gland. I'm going to point out one of numerous thyroid follicles and let's zoom and zoom and zoom and zoom. And so we see there is a thyroid follicle. Now it's, the thyroid follicle is lined all around the outside by these follicular cells. And all you see are purple dots. And those are the nuclei of individual follicular cells. And these follicular cells are responsible for making the T3 and T4 hormones, or the thyroid hormones. But the precursors to these three uh, T3, T4 hormones is this substance within the, each thyroid follicle called the colloid. And the colloid is the storage of future T3, T4 hormones that I'll talk about in a few minutes. Uh, this is very characteristic of telling the thyroid gland. Now, if we pan to another area and show these three thyroid follicles, early anatomists said, hey, what do we call these cells that look and stain differently than the follicular cells, but they're right beside the follicles? And they said, I got an idea. Why don't we name them the cells beside the thyroid follicles? Parafollicular cells. Now, they found out later on that these parafollicular cells secrete, produce and secrete the hormone calcitonin, which is why they are also now called C cells for producing calcitonin. Now, the parathyroid glands, I'm going to take one of those and blow it up histologically, is here. And these very, very cellular-looking cells are called chief cells. And chief cells make parathyroid hormone. 
These more red staining cells are called oxyphil cells, and I'm not really sure what they do. And that's not just me. Most uh, science doesn't quite know what they do. They might be uh, cells that were chief cells that don't function anymore. Most all parathyroid hormone comes from the chief cells. That's the main thing to know. Now, the thyroid gland produces the hormones T3, T4, and I'll talk about calcitonin in a few minutes. The chemical structure of these thyroid hormones is it's a tyrosine-derived hormone, so it's a peptide, so a protein. That, and so here we have both T4 and T3 shown in the schematic. However, the thyroid hormones of T3, T4 act intracellularly like a steroid hormone, so they're unique amongst the other uh, amino acid peptide-derived hormones. Now, when you talk about thyroid hormones, and you talk about thyroxine, now thyroxine is technically just T4, but often it's used to describe these thyroid hormones or T4, T3 hormones. You're going to see these terms used back and forth a lot in basic medicine. Most of the time, this is what we're just meeting. Thyroid, thyroxine, T4, T3 hormones are all these, the metabolic hormones secreted by follicular cells. T4 has four iodine, T3 has three. We're going to talk about that a little bit later. Now, the functions of these T3, T4 hormones is that they influence nearly every organ in the body, and they increase cellular metabolism, normal growth and development, and they have widespread, diverse, long-lasting effects. So how do you then regulate T3 and T4? Well, in this picture, we can see the hypothalamus and the anterior pituitary in blue, and then there's our thyroid follicles and then some effector organs. So what happens is if you have a decrease and the hypothalamus senses a decrease in concentration of T3, T4 hormones in the blood, the hypothalamus is going to release this um, thyrotropin releasing hormone or TRH through the hypophyseal portal system that targets cells in the anterior pituitary gland, which then secretes TSH or thyroid stimulating hormone that stimulates thyroid follicle cells and to then release T3 and T4 hormones into the blood, which then go and affect metabolic processes of effector organs. Now, as T3, T4 levels in the blood uh, increase, they produce a negative feedback to the anterior pituitary to stop making TSH, as well as a negative feedback to the hypothalamus to stop producing TRH. Um, negative. Now, so a goiter, uh, goiter um, is, uh, results in this increase in the size of a thyroid and an endemic goiter, the size of the thyroid gland is usually in most cases due to an iodine insufficiency. So here we have the thyroid follicle making non-functional T3, T4 because there's no iodine. So it's basically trying to make T3, T4, but all it's doing is producing uh, a hormone that is not effective. So the, so the hypothalamus and pituitary sense, there's no T3, T4, so they make more TSH. So they produce more TSH because there's no sense of T3 or a decreased sense of T3, T4, which makes the thyroid follicle get bigger because it's making more colloid, but it's insufficient, which then the anterior pituitary makes more TSH, which makes more colloid and the thyroid gets bigger and more TSH and the thyroid gets bigger. And next thing you know, you have an endemic goiter. Now, how is T3, T4 synthesized? Well, there is these eight steps to show from thyroglobulin synthesis all the way down to thyroid hormone secretion. Um, to now to show these eight steps, I'm going to go to the, back to this picture where we can see that purple dot is a thyroid follicle cell or the nucleus of one. On its basal surface is where the capillary abuts thyroid follicle cells, and on the apical surface is where the colloid is. So let's take a look at this little square and go shing and make a, a schematic and enlargement of that area and show in yellow there's a thyroid follicle cell and its basal surface is a capillary and the apical surface is colloid. So now what we're going to do is take that and blow it up and we're now going to go through the eight steps on this schematic. So step number one is showing a thyroglobulin synthesis. And so what happens is thyroid follicular cells take amino acids and the rough endoplasmic reticulum and Golgi apparatus are going to um, synthesize and secrete thyroglobulin, or TG, which is a large glycoprotein. And it's going to then take that and secrete it into the colloid lumen. Okay? And each uh, thyroglobulin contains 70, about 70 tyrosine amino acids. And that's going to be, and you can see the TY, that's going to be the major substrate that's going to combine with the iodine ions to make T3, T4. 
The second step is called iodide trapping. And so what happens is thyroid follicular cells actively transport iodide from the capillary into the cytosol through the sodium iodide symporters. For every two sodium being transported out, you get an iodide that comes in. And because iodide ions are so uh, big and bulky, they cannot diffuse out of the cell uh, and therefore they become trapped in the cytosol. The third step is called iodide diffusion, where iodide rapidly diffuses from the basal to the apical surface of the thyroid follicle cells and then enter the follicular lumen through this transporter called pendrin. And so now we have this iodide inside the colloid. Now the fourth step is called uh, thyroid peroxidase or TPO. And so TPO is an enzyme that's located on the apical membrane, and what its function is has two functions. One is it oxidizes um, iodide into iodine. So the green is iodide, and the TPO is going to make then iodine. The second function is it's going to attach the iodine to the tyrosine rings and the thyroglobulin. So there you can see the tyrosine, one of the 70 on the thyroglobulin, and TPO goes shing and puts it on there. And so what you now have is an iodated uh, thyroglobulin molecule. So now let's blow this up a little bit more in purple thyroglobulin or TG, and you see these two tyrosine, two of 70 that are on this thyroglobulin. Notice there's one iodine. That's called a monoiodotyrosine, or we abbreviate it MIT. And in the other one, there's two iodines. We call that diiodotyrosine, or DIT for short. Now let's go back to the picture, and you can see DIT and MIT only a couple of the, many, of the 70 that would be on that thyroglobulin molecule. Now, here we have step five. This is called coupling. And this is where the MITs and DITs bound to the thyroglobulin undergo coupling reactions where the ionidated ring of one MIT, so there we have it, of one MIT or DIT is added to the DIT at another spot forming T3 and T4. Now, I want to do that again. Let's do that again, except in a bigger picture. So there's thyroglobulin, and there's a. this is the coupling where the ionidated ring of one MIT or DIT is added to a DIT at another spot. DIT, DIT. Now let's take this MIT and add it. Now you count one, two, three iodines. So we call this triiodothyronine, or simply T3. Now watch, we take this DIT and add it to another DIT, one, two, three, four, and we call that thyroxine or simply T4. Now it's important to note at this point is that the T3, T4 molecules are formed but they're bound to this thyroglobulin molecule. So we now go to the sixth step. Um, and so that coupling, by the way, takes just a, you know minutes, hours to days to occur. This next step, number six, is where there's endocytosis of the thyroglobulin containing T3 and T4. So there's a T3, T4, and shing, it's then um, going to then, um, the follicular cells engulf portions of the colloid that contain thyroglobulin with T4 and T3, and they it's now inside of this little um, uh, vesicle. Now that brings into this next seventh step, which that colloid droplet that's containing the thyroglobulin is combined with a lysosome. Shing! And what happens then is the lysosome has these proteolyses uh, uh, that are going to then cleave T3 and T4 from the thyroglobulin. Watch the those pink lysosomes that come and just go shing like that. Shing! And now T4 and T3 are now off of the thyroglobulin. Then this last step is where T3 and T4 diffuse into the bloodstream. So watch, there's the T4, T3, they diffuse through a, a protein and they're now in the blood where 90% are these T4 molecules because they're not as active and then 10% are these T3 which are far more active. But what happens is as they, T4, T3 diffuse, uh, flow throughout the body, most of the T4 is converted into T3 at the peripheral tissues, okay? So there we have the whole thing. Now in blue, you can see thyroid stimulating hormone in the capillary, and on the basal surface of one of those follicular cells in blue is a thyroid stimulating hormone or TSH receptor. Now watch what happens when TSH diffuses and binds, it's then going to affect 
all of these things. It's going to do the following. It's going to help um, uh, increase the, the sodium iodine symporter. It's going to help increase the activity of TPO. It's going to increase in the... the uh, the rate of the coupling reaction, increase endocytosis of colloid, increase the cleavage of T4, T3 to increase the release, increase the release into the blood. Oh, I'm sorry, you guys. I have to go through my stars again. I thought I had one more star, but I didn't. So now the next hormone is called calcitonin that the thyroid gland produces. Now it's also a peptide hormone, which which means it binds in the outside of, of a G protein and causes some second messenger. So calcitonin's function is to decrease blood calcium concentration. Now, how does this work? Well, well, here we have that same histology, and then there is those parafollicular cells that are going to produce calcitonin, okay? So those parafollicular cells are inside this thyroid gland. Now, homeostasis, blood calcium levels are about 10 mg per 100 milliliter. When these parafollicular cells uh, uh, sense an increase in blood calcium concentration, those parafollicular cells secrete calcitonin. Now, calcitonin is going to do two things. One, it's going to target bone and stimulate calcium de deposition in bones by basically um, inhibiting what uh, osteoclasts do. And as a result, osteoblasts have a net helping more depositing more calcium than is being uh, uh, taken out. They also, calcitonin targets the kidney, which reduces calcium reabsorption of calcium from, uh, especially in the distal tubules, from the filtrate back into the bloodstream. So we excrete in our urine more calcium. And as a result, both of those things cause blood calcium levels to decline back to the set point, which then causes a negative feedback to the parafollicular cells and thyroid gland, then stops secreting calcitonin, which stops stimulating calcium deposit in bone and, and and reabsorption of kidney, which then sets back a chain of events, and we have homeostasis. And it stays that way until blood calcium increases, which then causes parafollicular cells to secrete calcitonin, and the process starts again. Now, parathyroid hormone from the parathyroid gland is the antagonist to calcitonin. It's also a peptide hormone. This is one of the first hormones studied in G-protein coupling, uh, G-protein reactions, actually. Uh, parathyroid hormone's function is to increase blood calcium concentration and promote phosphate excretion. So here we have the parathyroid glands in pink. So, and there's bone, there's renal tubular cells, and that's going to be the intestines. So when there's a, when parathyroid glands sense a decrease in blood calcium concentration, they secrete parathyroid hormone, which then targets bone. Now specifically in bone, it targets osteoblasts. Now there, there are no PTH receptors on osteoclasts. So osteoblasts set in a chain of events that then stimulate osteoclasts to do two things. One, start breaking down and reabsorption, reabsorbing the bone matrix, calcium and phosphate, dumping in the blood, and also causes proliferation to increase the number of osteoclasts, both of which cause the following, an increase in blood calcium concentration and phosphate in the blood. Now, parathyroid hormone also targets the renal tubular cells, and what they do is they cause the renal tubular cells to increase reabsorption of calcium from the filtrate back into the bloodstream. It also helps to decrease reabsorption of the phosphate from filtrate back into the bloodstream, or in other words, you pee out more phosphate. This results in an increase in calcium and a decrease in phosphate in the blood. Now, PTH also causes the following to occur. PTH upregulates an enzyme um, that's responsible for converting 25-hydroxy vitamin D um, into its activated form called 1-2-5-dihydroxy vitamin D. So PTH increases um, 1-25-vitamin D3 synthesis. And what happens is that then targets intestinal cells and the duodenum jejunum, which increase calcium reabsorption uh, from uh, the food in the lumen, which results in an increase in blood calcium concentration. So I just put a yellow arrow on the renal tubular cells where PTH 
um, decreases the reabsorption of phosphate. So you end up urinating or excreting out much more phosphate. This has a pretty big effect, so much so that it many cases overcomes what is uh, put into the uh, phosphate put into the blood from osteo um, uh, the activity in the bone. So parathyroid hormone overall increases blood calcium and decreases blood phosphate concentration. And then what happens is as you increase blood calcium to a set point, it has a negative feedback on parathyroid glands. So this, my friends, is the thyroid and parathyroid gland in a nutshell. Mm-hmm.